Good afternoon or morning or evening, whatever it is where you are. Uh, thanks for joining our program today. My name is Lauren Gilbert. I'm the Senior Manager for Public Services here at the Center for Jewish History. If you joined a little earlier, you may have seen a slideshow of a few upcoming center programs. Uh, you can always sign up for center and partner programs via the calendar link on our website, which is cjh.org. Uh, I'd like to thank the Leo Beck Institute for co-sponsoring and presenting this program with us today. The program is being recorded and you will be able to watch it on the center's YouTube page and web page within a couple of weeks. If you have questions, please put them uh, in the Q&A box and we will get to them at the end, uh, as many as we have time for. I see a comment from someone saying you're not showing up on the screen. This is a webinar, so only the panelists are visible on the screen, but we will be able to see your questions uh, in the Q&A. So this program is part of our Out of the Box series. Uh, at the Center for Jewish History, there are tens of thousands of boxes in our partners' archival collections, uh, boxes filled with photographs, journals, letters, artwork, and other documents. And uh, we take these treasures out of the box in this series. Uh, so let me introduce today's speakers. Uh, Michael Simonson is Director of Public Outreach and Head of the Dr. Robert Ira Louis Reference Services Division at the Leo Beck Institute, where he has worked for the past 20 years. Uh, Nancy Berliner is the Wu Tung Senior Curator of Chinese Art at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Her previous position was at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts, where she spearheaded the Yin Yu Tang Project, relocating an 18th century Chinese residence to the museum. Uh, she is also the author of an article about David Ludwig Bloch's artwork and a new book called China and Ashkenazic Jewry, Transcultural Encounters. Uh, so thank you to both of you. I'm gonna mute myself and turn my camera off and I'll come back at the end uh, for the Q&A. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Simonson, and uh, um, as mentioned, I am the Director of Public Outreach and Head of Reference Services at the Leo Beck Institute, and I wanted to welcome you all today to our discussion about David Ludwig Bloch, a Jewish artist in Shanghai. Um, born in 1910 in Bavaria, Bloch was a young man who was able to escape to Shanghai, China, like so many other German and Austrian Jewish refugees. Already um, working and engaged as an artist in Germany, he continued to create while living in Shanghai. Um, at the Leo Beck Institute, we are pleased to have a large collection of his artwork and papers that were donated to us by him directly um, before his death. Together, um, the papers and the artwork he gave us form a substantial part of our collections. And as is mentioned, I'm kind of going over the same stuff, but I did want to thank Nancy Berliner for joining me today. Though I can speak about um, Bloke's life from a biographical perspective, I've invited Nancy to join us today because she can provide knowledge of Bloch's work as an artist and I think put him in the larger perspective of Chinese art history, which is something I cannot do. <laughs> so thank you, Nancy, for joining us. That's really great. My pleasure. Um, I'm gonna, uh, thank you. I'm going to um, share my screen. Yes, David Ludwig Bloch, an artist in Shanghai. And um, I'm gonna start um, by showing his identity card here. This is um, David Ludwig Bloch's um, identity card from Shanghai which includes a photograph of him. And I wanted to provide a general background on his life before going into greater specifics. Uh, David Ludwig Bloch was born in Floss in 1910. The family had lived in Floss um, back a few generations, for many generations. It was a small town, is a small town in the Oberpfalz, very close to the current border um, with the Czech Republic. Bloch's father ran a successful business and they lived in a comfortable middle-class home, complete as was customary for the time with um, a nanny and a cook and some other help. Um, and they were predestined to live a comfortable middle-class existence, um, but sadly tragedy struck. His mother 
became very ill after giving birth to him. And she died only 40 days later. A few months after that, his father died of a sudden heart attack. Thus, David was orphaned by the age of one. His grandmother stepped in and largely raised him from infancy. Uh, David and his grandmother lived above the family-owned grocery store in Floss through his young years. And she, in essence, um, uh, became his mother. He also became close to his nanny, which um, served as a, another foster parent. As a very little boy, it was noticed by people in the family that he spoke very little. Um, relatives in Munich convinced the family to have David examined and the results discovered he was almost entirely deaf. When the school year started, he was sent to Munich and enrolled in an academy for the deaf. He learned to read lips and began to study the humanities, including art. Um, as a young man, he studied porcelain production um, in addition to art, and it led to his first job in Selb, Germany, in particular, designing and painting porcelain. And he was the master designer, creating the designs, and other people followed them. Um, here, um, I wanted to show this quickly. This is um, what was soon to happen uh, to, David Lug uh, to David Ludwig Bloch um, with the advent of the Nazis and the Kristallnacht, he, like um, many other Jewish refugees in Germany and Austria, uh, uh, had to flee the country. And Shanghai was a place where people could go because they um, did not need a visa. So many people fled there if they could get there. And um, we're going to return to this image later. I, you know, I kind of wanted to start with this image. I talked to Nancy about it, too because um, I think it's kind of a, an, another kind of overall view of his life as an artist um, and as a refugee. Okay, so anyway, and we'll be returning to this image later, but it show, it's, um, it's something he made in Shanghai as a Jewish refugee. But I'm, I'm using this picture kind of as an introduction to my talk. And you, we'll return to it later on. Um, this is a painting of Floss, Germany, um, as it looked in 1933 by David Ludwig Bloch after the war. So this is Floss, Germany, um, painted by David Ludwig Bloch. It's his hometown, um, painted, and um, he painted it, um, as it as it looked in 1933 there. And it was given to the city. And I'm not actually sure on the date it was painted, I, I think after the war, but there may be family members here who know more about that. So just to show you, it was a very small town in the Oberpfalz. Now I'll go to this next one. See there. Um, so this is porcelain work um, that he did as a master designer. Some porcelain, he, he um, the, the painting and the graphics he designed, and then others copied that work. So this is two examples of his work in his career in Germany. He was also working, continuing to work to become an independent artist in this time. In this painting um, titled Dachau, um, it was done after the war and it can be found now in the Dachau Concentration Camp Museum. And in this painting, um, Bloch shows a roll call taking place soon after the Kristallnacht. Um, like thousands of other Jewish men following the Kristallnacht in November 1938, Bloch was arrested and spent time in a concentration camp, Dachau in his case. Um, here the men were held for many weeks or even months, where they were forced to stand for long roll calls, march for hours in formation, engage in manual brack baking labor, and they were victims of beatings, torture, sometimes execution. Bloch survived his time in Dachau, despite the fact that as a deaf person, it would have been even more dangerous for him. In this painting, we see the men organized by blocks under the searchlights in a roll call taking place during the night or perhaps the early morning hours. The roll call often lasted several hours with the prisoner standing at attention. It was one of the ways of humiliating and torturing them. Uh, he survived in Dachau four weeks and then he was freed. Um, I guess I should mention at this point, 
as far as Holocaust history. The Nazis at this point didn't plan to imprison and murder all the Jews. All the Jews. Uh, these arrests after Kristallnacht of the men was an attempt to intimidate them into fleeing the country and expropriating the money and belongings of German Jews. And most of the men were freed after a few weeks to a month or two. However, not everyone knew uh, how by now, after the Kristallnacht, everyone knew their only hope was to uh, try and flee the country. Uh, I return now to this picture of DP Nobody. And um, I was going to ask Nancy Berliner. I know she had a few comments she wanted to make about it. Um, um, because it is, in a way, symbolic of Ludwig, uh, David Ludwig Bloch's status as a, as a Jewish refugee. So, yeah. Nancy? Yeah, so yeah. this image, for me, is very powerful. It really gives the sense of, of Bloch um, and all the other refugees and the hopelessness they probably uh, felt when they first arrived in Shanghai. Uh, it says DP nobody. DP would have been displaced person. And uh, but if you see over on the left hand side of the chest, it actually says block. Um, so it's both it's both him, and it it stands for every other displaced person. Um, there are a number of symbols that you can see that definitely distinguish him as being in Shanghai. There's the thermos, um, which even today is um, kind of a basic piece of equipment in anybody's house. There's the enamel pot for eating. Uh, in the background is the rickshaw. Um, and we'll be learning more about Block and, and rickshaws later on, but that was a very important symbol, both for Block of Shanghai and China, as well as uh, it was a very important symbol at that time period for the oppressed masses in China. And if you look at the background, that's the skyline of Shanghai, and there's one triangular skyscraper there and that was the Sassoon house which was owned by uh, the Baghdadi Jewish family the Sassoons so that's that's really Shanghai um, in a nutshell right there in that image and it's, um, both exquisitely created as well as really just says everything about about the people at that time period so. thanks thanks Nancy now, here's a real photograph of Shanghai compared to the print we just saw. Bloch, like uh, many German and Austrian Jews trying to escape Europe, was unable um, to get papers out to other places, even though he had relatives in the United States who were trying to help. And receiving visas had become almost impossible for everyone. Certainly, it was even harder for someone with a disability. Uh, countries that would accept you wanted to know you wouldn't become a burden on the system financially and that you could find gainful employment and not be on welfare. Uh, so Shanghai was really the only place that accepted refugees from Germany and Austria without a visa and these requirements. So in the end, Bloch obtained passage and in May 1940, he arrived in the city. And I'm sure like many of the other Jews, uh, Jewish refugees, it was a place they never would have imagined themselves finding, finding themselves living in. Um, this is a photograph of the Bund, which is the main thoroughway in Shanghai around the time of his arrival there. And before we talk about the art further, I want to briefly describe the Jewish refugee community in Shanghai. Um, so the Jews generally arrived in Shanghai with very little. In fact, the tickets for the voyage to Shanghai largely took up purposely on the, on the part of the Nazis, uh, the last of their savings. And so when they reached Shanghai, the majority were quite poor. In addition, Shanghai itself was already full of Chinese refugees. People from other parts of the country originally fleeing the Japanese invasion and or the Chinese Civil War. In fact, Shanghai as a city was already under Japanese control but there were sections of the city that were declared international concessions, such as the French concession, which is where Bloch first lived. 
um, and the Jewish refugees also were able to settle in these areas. Many others lived in Hongqiu, which was a poorer and more overcrowded district. Bloch was eventually to move there. Things worsened uh, for the Jewish refugees in Shanghai. Over time, uh, the number of refugees was about 23,000. They had largely been supported with funds provided by the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee but, and other organizations. But with the attack on Pearl Harbor and the American entry into the war, this money disappeared. There were still other sources of support, however, including the Sassoon family in Shanghai, a Sephardic Jews who were important business people in the city. To worsen matters, the Nazis put pressure on the Japanese to create a Jewish ghetto that would concentrate all the Jews in Shanghai in Hankyu. And this ghetto was established in February 1943 and resulted in a massive overcrowding of, of the people in Hankyu. Uh, Jews were not allowed to leave the ghetto without a pass issued from the Japanese authorities. They were given three months to move into the ghetto. And many of them by this time had managed to establish homes or businesses outside of the designated area. So they lost everything in this second move into this area that was now designated for stateless refugees. Many were forced to live in crowded group homes, which were also called Haima. Bloch was lucky enough to manage a room of his own, uh, to get a room of his own in a small studio. Uh, this was likely with the help of money supplied um, by American relatives. So after Japan entered the war, this financial support must also have proven very tricky. I'm going back to this. On the left is a street in Hankyu. On the right is a crowded sleeping area of men in one of these heim that I was just describing. Here in this picture, we have uh, people standing outside in the alley preparing food and then a picture of one of these alleys in the Hankyu district. So you get the idea of the atmosphere crowded together, uh, poverty stricken as well. So a community did develop among the Jewish refugees in Shanghai, despite the obstacles. Schools were established, newspapers, cafes, social clubs. Uh, the refugees, as I said earlier, received help from the Sassoon family and the Jewish community that already existed in Shanghai from the American Jewish Joint as long as it could, and then from some other various agencies as well. Um, in addition, uh, people did manage in many cases to receive money from relatives in safer places. So we have to remember in the big scheme of things, Shanghai was actually a very cheap place to be. So it was not a lot of money for an American could go a lot, for example, could go a lot farther in Shanghai. Thus, even after the ghetto was established and things worsened considerably, there remained a, a cultural life that survived in Shanghai. And here we have some examples of an upper left, a, a German restaurant, uh, some men playing chess, and a couple um, sitting in front of one of their homes having a kind of breakfast. By the way, these pictures are largely from the United Nations Refugee I can't remember, the UNRAA, Relief Association, and they were taken mostly right after the Second World War to talk about what was needed for refugees. All right, this is a soup kitchen. It's an example of the support from the international Jewish organizations and other aid organizations. Many people depended on these soup kitchens to, uh, to receive nutrition and, and survive. Um, this is a cafe. So going the other way, it shows that some people had a, were able to afford a certain kind of standard of living. Uh, I believe this was called the Barcelona Cafe. And it was um, owned by a family from Vienna. So the, the, the food and, 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 and luxury items were, were not common. People were able to sometimes afford them and have a little bit more, or at least a feeling of a, of a normal middle-class life. Bloch continued to stay in Shanghai for a number of years after the war ended in 1945. Now this painting done in 1949 shows a street scene um, in Shanghai. And with this painting, I'm going to move into discussing and showing Bloch's work. 
So these are two woodblock prints he did, which are kind of nice bucolic scenes of China. In China, and Nancy, correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is in China, Bloch, who had up to then focused on painting, um, discovered or immersed himself in block printing. And um, there are uh, many possible reasons for this, partly maybe to do with the historical background of this kind of artwork in China that Nancy uh, Berliner will be sharing with us coming up about Bloch. Um, so anyway, these are some examples of his more pleasant prints, let's say. Um, but David Ludwig Bloch was actually um, very interested, I think more interested in capturing the everyday sights, sounds, and people of Shanghai. And I think this is where his work really soars. Um, most of his artwork reflects this interest. Um, this image is of a business in Shanghai that serves ice cream and makes coffins. That's certainly odd, but perhaps nothing so out of the ordinary for an open front businesses that exist and crowded together throughout Shanghai and uh, particularly perhaps in Hong Kyu. And this image actually has an even deeper historical note. David Ludwig Bloch needed wood to create his wood blocks, a wood supplier. And he struck a deal with the coffin maker who also sold ice cream in this shop. And it is from the wood supply for coffins that Bloch purchased what he needed to make his own wood blocks. Street life scenes. Uh, Shanghai was in the scenes he captured was chaotic and crowded. Here are some more businesses and streets that Block captured through wood block printing. You can see here. We'll be seeing a lot of art. So I'll go through these um, kind of quick. This is a rather humorous image. A man poses for maybe it's for an advertisement or maybe propaganda purposes in front of a fake screen in a fake car. Yes. Actually, these are quite common or were common uh, in China wow. even up until the 80s and 90s, where itinerant photographers would go around and they would hang up uh, a screen made out of fabric, a painting on a screen. And, uh, and often one could pose in front uh, of a car as well. I even remember when I first went to China, I had my photograph taken in front of a car in front of the Forbidden Ooh. City, because that was just the end all be all to be in front of a car. What I love about this one is that the background is the Temple of Heaven, which is in Beijing. The sign in the front says that this is the, the Beijing photography studio Shanghai branch. So it was the Shanghai branch. So they were in Shanghai having themselves taken, having a photograph taken of themselves as if they were in Beijing. That, that was- Thank you, Nancy. That's, that I have given Nancy permission to interrupt me throughout this, which I'm thankful for, Nancy. Thanks. In this scene, a man is having his hat snatched while taking public transport in Shanghai under a sign that warns people, in fact, of hat snatchers. <laughs> so a lot of humorous things too. Um, at this point, I'd like to invite Nancy Berliner more into the conversation because she's going to share with us some of her insights about David Ludwig Bloch and his relationship to the Chinese people he encountered, um, to his work making Bloch prints, and maybe his artwork also in the larger narrative of Chinese art history. Um, but first, Nancy, um, well, first, let me say this is a picture of David Ludwig Bloch himself sitting there surrounded by um, Chinese children. Go ahead. I was just to say this photograph gives us a real sense of him, of how much he was just into uh, street life in, and relating to all sorts of people in Shanghai. Some of the other photographs that we saw was only Europeans sitting with Europeans. But here we see that that uh, Block was really very much part of, of, of the scene and he, he didn't just stay within his European culture. He really melded into the whole Shanghai world. And you also, you know, see this wonderful face um, 
Uh, he was deaf, but he had an incredible ability to relate to people, um, whether they spoke the same language or not. So. Yeah, and I, I think it, my impression is many times the refugee community stayed within its own. So I, I do think David Ludwig Bloch was maybe an exception to this, being more engaged with the Chinese people. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I'll go to the next image now. This is actually kind of the same as the photo. It's David Ludwig Bloch sitting there surrounded by um, uh, these children. And I'm going to go to the next one. Maybe you can talk about this, Nancy, the signature. Sure. Um, and, and this is, again, another instance where we see how involved he became with Chinese culture. So what is this? This is a seal. Uh, and a seal is used in Chinese culture. It has it, your name uh, written on it. And it's used almost like a signature on a painting or a piece of calligraphy or a letter. Uh, anything where you would usually sign something, people use seals. And so David Ludwig Block um, took for himself a Chinese name, and he had these seals made for himself, which he placed on all of his artwork. Um, now, his name was Block in German, and uh, so he took the name in Chinese that sound, it's three characters, because most names in Chinese are three characters. And he took three characters that kind of sounded like block. And they're Bai Lu He. So um, he, um, the, the words that he chose are Bai, which is a family name in Chinese, but also means white. Lu, which means green, and He, which means black. So his name was White Green Black. Um, and these are two different seals with, with his same name on them. And we'll see them again as, as we go through more of the images. But you can just see that he's integrating Chinese aesthetics and Chinese art um, formats into his own artwork. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Nancy, maybe we can discuss this next. Yeah, so I really love this work and uh, this page. It's a it's a center fold from a Chinese magazine, and this was among all of uh, Block's archives um, at the Leo Beck Institute when when I went in to study it. So, but this is from a Chinese magazine. And block is not represented here. This is just uh, woodblock prints that were made just about the same time period. So he must have opened a magazine, seen these, got very excited with them, put them in his um, piles of things that he was collecting and continued to carry these images around for the rest of his life. Um, and what you see here um, are very typical of the woodblock prints that were being done in China in the 30s and 40s. There was a man named Lu Xun, who was a revolutionary um, in China. He'd been trained as a doctor, but he was very, he felt the revolution was very important and important that the revolution be uh, represented through all forms of culture, for instance, in writing and literature, as well as in artwork. And he followed the European example of people like Katja Kollwitz and encouraged uh, Chinese artists to work in woodblock prints as a way of being um, creating the art of the people, both that the people could create woodblock prints as well as uh, that, that the works could be mass distributed. Uh, if you make one artwork, uh, it usually ends up costing a lot of money, but with woodblock prints, you can produce a lot and, and share them with many, many people. And so uh, Lu Xun encouraged artists. He actually set up classes. He invited Japanese woodblock printers to come to China. 
and teach courses in how to do woodblock prints. And you can see that most of the images, just like as in Europe, uh, were images of the working people, the suffering people. And so this is very, very uh, common art form in China in the 30s and 40s. I'm not sure if Bloch saw these first and then started doing his images of the working people, or if he was doing the working people before he even saw these Chinese examples of woodblock prints. We know certainly by 1941, he was doing works not so dissimilar to these in Shanghai. Yeah, he's clearly showing the working people in yes. his own work. Yeah. Yes. We'll look at some, of some examples of his working people. Um, here is an umbrella seller uh, and, and a buyer there. And it's just really charming image. Um, very common on the streets of Shanghai. And again, it's, it's the working people. Um, some of the ar other artists that came to Shanghai were only portraying the well-to-do and um, the kind of hip jazz um, part of the culture. But, but Bloch was very interested in the street scenes and, and the working people. Uh, and beggars, he actually did a whole book on beggars and they're all so individualized. I mean, you really feel that he empathizes with each of these people um, and the, um, many of them uh, have disabilities, each one a different disability. Um, this man has, has taken off his fake leg um, and he has in front of him something that's very common, which is a, a written explanation of his situation. Um, this is, I know, and please feel free to keep talking, Nancy. This is, I, I believe, homeless people, beggars, sleeping in front of a store, which ironically is advertising all this comfort. Right. It's a, in, in Chinese, it says it's a sofa store. Uh, yeah. um, and mm -hmm. it's called the Healthy and Good Fortune Sofa Store. Um, and clearly, um, there were a lot of people who, who didn't who did not have that comfort. And, and he saw the irony in it and he, and he really felt it and he um, pushed for it. And he did a, another fun thing because he was always doing clever little things where he made the street number 1948, which must've been the year that he made the work, um, which was just one year before the revolution in China, 1949, uh, quote unquote, liberation of China. Right. Um, this is a self-portrait of David Ludwig Bloch taking a rickshaw. And this brings um, me to um, his series on rickshaws. He did a few series or typologies and rickshaws was one of them. And as you said already, um, um, beggar, beggars was another. Uh, I believe shop people was still another. So um, this is actually um, a photograph David Ludwig Bloch took of rickshaw drivers in Shanghai, <laughs> so. And just a little note about rickshaws. Yeah. Um, rickshaws, amazingly, were invented in Japan in 1873, these hand-pulled ones. And they came to Shanghai in 1874. At first, they were mostly Japanese-owned, but gradually um, there were many Chinese companies that, that owned the, the rickshaws and rented them out to people um, coming in from the countryside. Uh, at, as Michael mentioned, there was a lot of chaos and war and poverty in the countryside at this time people period. So there were a lot of immigrants from the countryside coming into Shanghai. By the 1940s, there were over a hundred thousand rickshaw pullers in wow. Shanghai alone. And as you can see from this image, there was a lot of competition for the clients um, and people could not make much of a living. You can make a little bit of a living. 
And uh, rickshaws really became the symbol of the oppressed masses in China, um, not, not just for David Block, but for all Chinese. Um, there was a very important uh, revolutionary novel in 1937 that was called Rickshaw Boy. Um, and so it, it, he picked up on that symbol, whether he, you know, knew about this novel or not. Um, it was not translated into Chinese till 1946, and he was already doing many uh, images of rickshaws at that time period. Mm -hmm. Here's another one from the scene, I guess, two lovers, you know, rickshaw. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is an advertisement for exhibit of watercolors and woodcuts, and it was created by um, David Ludwig Bloch. And um, I'm going to have Nancy talk a little bit about this, I think, so if that's okay, Nancy. Sure. So you can see that there are three palettes, and each palette is a different language. One is Chinese, one is Japanese, and one is English. And if you recall, the um, Block's Chinese name translates to white, green, black. And then if we look at the palettes, we can see one is white, one is green, one is black. So that like his, his, um, his cleverness coming through again. Uh, one of the other interesting things ab about this advertisement is this is 1942. And this exhibition is at the Shanghai Art Gallery. Um, Shanghai Art Gallery was on Nanjing Road, which was kind of the Fifth Avenue of Shanghai at that time period. So it was in a very prominent place. It was actually owned by a Japanese man, and they showed there both Japanese art and Chinese art, all contemporary artworks as well. And Block uh, visited there, and he must have gotten to know the owner of the gallery uh, who invited him to do a one-man show there. And the show was reviewed not just in the Jewish press, but also in uh, the local English press, as well as in uh, the Chinese press. So Block was really being celebrated by the larger community of Shanghai, which was fabulous. Yeah. Uh, of the exhibition from a Chinese newspaper of the time period. Um, and, the, and he is called here White Green Black, Mr. White Green Black. Um, this reviewer preferred the watercolors to the woodblock prints. <laughs> I think this is also the one where it talks about how Goya was in attendance. Is that yes. correct? Yeah. Yes. Um, and we're going to see another image that will bring up all these um, yeah, Japanese characters. Yeah. So well, this is a work that that Block did. Uh, I th he did it in 1946, but it's very much about 1943. And somewhere on here is a date. I don't see it right now, but I think it's fe uh, here. It is uh, February. 18th, 1943. That mm -hmm. was the day that the ghetto was established and instituted and all the Jews, uh, the Jews, the stateless Jews had to move into the ghetto. The Baghdadi Jews um, and the Russian Jews did not have to move into the ghetto, but the ba uh, but the, the Jews from Europe needed to move in there and they were kept in there and you had to get a pass. You had to fill out an application in order to leave the ghetto. Um, and if you did get a pass, you were given one of these buttons. You see the little button with the safety pin attached to it? Mm -hmm. That means that's a pass that allowed you to wander outside of, of the Hongqiu ghetto. Um, we see a couple of names of characters around here as well. Over on the right side, it says Kubota. Uh, Kubota was the person that was in charge of all stateless refugees. 
Uh, he was Japanese. As you recall, the, the Japanese had come in uh, and taken over Shanghai. So they were in charge. Uh, Sakura, um, which you see in black letters there, Sakura was a group uh, that was established by the Japanese, um, but it was made up of Russian Jews. And, um, and they were forced to give money to help the stateless Jews who lived in the ghetto. So that's what mm. Sakura is. And there's somewhere else in here, I think it says Goya, and uh, or Goya, who was a Japanese man. He called himself the king of the Jews. And he was the person who decided whether or not you could go in and out of the ghetto. So he was a very, very powerful person. But um, if we look at the list of people who attended some of Bloch's exhibition, it includes Kubota and Goya. So um, mm -hmm. he, he, he must have had some kind of relationship with them and they were very harsh uh, against the Jews. But at the same time, um, they weren't quite as bad as they could have been. The Nazis actually requested that they exterminate all these stateless Jews and Kubota and Goya uh, refused to do that. So. Mm -hmm. this, so this is David Ludwig Bloch and his wife, uh, Lily Dessieu in Shanghai. I think I'm saying the last name correct, Dessieu. Um, Bloch met Lily at a social club for the deaf in Shanghai. She was deaf as well. And a relationship began and they married in Shanghai. Um, following the war, they stayed in Shanghai a few more years. And with help from Bloch's relatives in the United States, they were able to immigrate in 1949. They settled north of New York City and started to make a new life for themselves in Mount Vernon. Uh, they had two sons. Uh, Bloch worked for 27 years at a company called Commercial Decal. Um, he was very much picking up his original career in Germany as a painter on porcelain for the company. This is a plate um, done by him when he worked for Commercial Decal. I know he did a set of porcelain plates for President Lyndon Johnson's administration in the White House. Um, each plate had a different state flower on it. Um, Bloch visited Germany again in 1976, and from that point on, the Holocaust became an intense subject of his art, uh, and the visual language of his art became these kind of scenes. He exhibited it at various um, shows around the United States, including at YIVO, the YIVO Institute, now at the Center for Jewish History. He also had a one-man retrospective at the Jewish Museum in Munich in 2000 on his 90th birthday. Um, I think the Slater art is interesting because we also see him using block printing techniques as he has, had done in Shanghai during the war. Um, so on one hand, he has these colorful decorative porcelain paintings he's doing to make a living, but in his own more private artwork, he goes back to these printing techniques. So this is, this is actually a lino cut, which is a, a kind of traditional wood print cut. Um, uh, it's also interesting that at the end of his life, he chose to confront the Holocaust in his artwork um, with the experience of the concentration camps, Dachau, of which he had been incarcerated in himself for four weeks in 1938. Um, but a lot of his work from this Holocaust period at towards the end of his life, he's clearly um, mourning much of what he himself escaped, the Holocaust itself, which took the lives of so many of his relatives and friends who were unable to leave Europe. So this is a roll call taking place and it's similar to the painting we saw at the beginning of the program. Um, this image, uh, and he did a few that show hands, presents to us kind of skeletal figures in camp uniforms. And this is actually titled Crying Hands. And of course it, it has an extra meaning um, I think because as, as a deaf person, Bloch communicated through sign language. This last piece captures the belongings of Jews in a forest scene and 
it recalls clearly the, the murder of, of people, including children in the Holocaust. So this last image I want to show you, um, and we'll say a close up look on it, is from Shanghai again. And I think it um, nicely ties uh, with the end of the presentation. This is, we have a copy of this at the Leo Beck Institute, but it's also at the United States Holocaust Museum, and I'm using their digital version. And you can maybe see, though I know it's super small, it's another view, it shows all the small businesses, foot traffic, rickshaws, street vendors. But if one was to look at this closely on the far left, here we see on the far left, we see that David Ludwig Block has created his own shop <laughs> where he's selling his hand colored woodcuts. Um, and next to the store, of course, we see a man with a rickshaw, which was an image which is so important for him in his artwork. I, I also like this because I think it shows Block as, as being playful and a bit whimsical, particularly in how he signed and included himself in his work. Uh, David Ludwig Bloch died in 2002 in Mount Vernon, New York. Um, we're happy to have, as I said, a large body of his artwork and some of his papers at the Leo Beck Institute. And I hope in this presentation, um, both myself and Nancy Berliner have been able to bring you um, an engaging story about a very interesting man and uh, the very interesting work that he did. Thank you, Michael and Nancy. Um, there are a bunch of questions, but while the slides are still up, there were lots and lots of questions about a swastika image on um, the page, I think, with his, his uh, signature, if you could go back to that. Absolutely. And I'll go back also to some of the yeah. earlier ones during questions, just because I, um, I know yeah, that yeah. they weren't so big for people to see. Yeah, the background fabric looks like. Mm -hmm. I'm happy. I'm happy to answer that. The swastika sure. image, actually the word I believe comes from Sanskrit and it's a very ancient symbol. Um, it's just uh, that that the Nazis took it up, but um, you see it in Native American art, you see it in, in uh, Indian art and, and it was very popular in China. Um, it was a Buddhist symbol uh, for longevity. So uh, if you go into a Buddhist temple in China, you see swastikas everywhere and it just became a, a very common decorative motif in China. But interesting that Block would have kept it given its later, um, you know, its later meanings and what it would have signified to him in addition to the ancient symbolism that I imagine this piece of fabric or paper with the swastika image was part of the larger collection. So um, the painting itself, or, or the woodblock print in this case, is on paper. And then it is mounted on to other paper with a fabric surround. So this is a very common type of silk fabric that people use for mounting paintings, framing paintings, or, or clothes. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, we have an image of the swastika. It just um, means so much to us that, that right. we think of the Holocaust. Um, but before the Holocaust, it was just a very common symbol all over the world. Right. right. But it is interesting that he mounted his own artwork on a background with the swastika because he knew what the swastika meant for the Nazis. Um, there's now that you're back towards the beginning, there's a question about the writing on the bottom of the DP nobody slide. I'll go to that. Yeah. I think that's a, just his signature on the right. I see. Um, mm -hmm. And there are a few questions about why things are so many things are written in English, given that um, his language would have been German. Uh, English was one of the basic international languages in Shanghai at that time. And um, the man was really brilliant. So he, he must have been just learning all the language. I mean, when he writes Chinese, he writes Chinese beautifully. Mm -hmm. um, There's a question, how many languages did he speak or write? I don't know the answer to that myself. Mm -hmm. um, and, and more on the language question, 
Mm -hmm. um, about did he read lips and did he learn to lip read in Chinese um, and how he handled the German to Chinese uh, lip reading. <laughs> I, I think he did know. I mean, he did use lip reading and I think that he did uh, I think he did learn some Chinese lip reading. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go back. Oh, sorry. I also wanted to mention just about the English language thing. I think the Jewish refugees in Shanghai, I know some people have written about this. They were not planning to stay there after the war. For, for the mass refugee community, it was only a transit stop to who knew where they were going, much as this print implies. But they weren't planning to stay in Shanghai, and many and many people were thinking Israel, South America, Australia, and the United States. But the United States, um, from what I understand, was the biggest draw and the biggest hope for people. So people were already, in a certain way, through language and maybe even in some ways culturally, becoming Americanized, if that makes sense, in preparation for maybe getting to America or Australia as well, which was another big uh, goal point for the Jewish refugee community in Shanghai after, after the war. Um, there's a question from someone named Faith about uh, whose husband was in Shanghai from 1940 mm -hmm. to 1958, asking if you know of anyone else who stayed there as long as he did till 1958. I, I can answer this, but Nancy, you're welcome to as well. I do not know personally, but I know stories and documentation of people who stayed their whole, you know, their whole lives. So even into the 1970s and 80s. Um, did he have a family, children? Yes, he had two children. One of, some, then one, one of them might be in the audience today, actually. I'm not sure. <laughs> if they are, they're welcome to add to this presentation. That would be if they have um, what, what was his relationship to Judaism? Um, you know, I think that, uh, David, I think that uh, I, don't, I don't think of him as, 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 as an overly religious person, for sure. I think he was part of the secularized German culture and society, as were so many German-speaking Jews at that time in Germany itself. And so I think that certainly, I mean, obviously, his family could say much more than me, but just from me on the outside looking in, you know, in his work and so on, uh, there's not a lot, I don't see a lot or any, really hardly any religious themes, for example. I think he was maybe more culturally Jewish or had a, a basic faith. Um, but I don't, I don't think he was invested in any, in any kind of uh, uh, lived religion, let's say. Um, and a question about the um, population of refugees in Shanghai, was it mainly German and Jew Austrian Jews or did they also come from other countries like Poland, for example? They came hey. from other countries. Oh, sorry, Nancy. Um, they came from other countries, but mostly Germany and Austria. But Nancy, go ahead. No, I think you're right. I mean, there certainly were um, Polish and Lithuanian, but uh, I, probably a large number of them were German and Austrian. Also, they were the ones who could probably afford better to buy the ship, the tickets. Mm -hmm. And a question about uh, his artistic influences besides Asian art, who are his other artistic influences? Did you um, want to take that, Nancy? Well, yeah, he, I'm like, like Nancy, go for European, it. European European art. He did beautiful watercolors. Mm -hmm. And a, a question about his art, like who were his buyers and when, what were the years he created his art, which I, I mean, I think you covered some of that, but who were his buyers generally? Uh, in, in China, I, I'd say, um, probably Europeans as well as Chinese and, and Japanese. Um, yeah, I think that's an important thing to bring up. I mean, in Shanghai, I, I feel like he, um, in China, he really, he really was very, um, in some ways, part of the larger artistic cultural life, at least in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I think that's quite a difference compared to many German speaking Jewish refugees who kind of hung out together and, and lived really 
within their community and weren't necessarily um, branched out into life in Shanghai itself. I mean, for one thing, these people were largely, I mean, not that David Block was also doing this, but as these pe people were very invested in just trying to survive, you know, like, like uh, maybe it wasn't at the level of the horrible things going on in Europe, but it was very pressing. What, what are we going to eat? How are we going to going to be able to keep living here next month? What you know, there was always this pressure, and I think that I think that that kind of pressure and focus kept a lot of people from really, you know, they weren't really out exploring the city <laughs> or the artwork, you know. Yeah. So, and I they would. also had they created their own cultural life as well. There were many, there were Yiddish newspapers, German mm -hmm. newspapers, there were Yiddish radio stations, there was theater, people writing plays, playing music. Um, so there was a, a big cultural life that centered around uh, European culture. Right. Um, well, thank you both. Uh, we're past five o'clock, so we probably need to wrap it up. There's, I saw a question, is this being recorded? Yes, the program was recorded and will be available at the center's website, cjh.org, uh, within a couple of weeks. Uh, if you're registered for the program, you will receive an email with a link, a shareable link to the program. Um, so thank you all very much uh, for participating. If we didn't get to your program and you'd like me to forward anything to uh, Michael or Nancy, um, please reach out to me at lgilbert at uh, cjh.org. Michael, you want to put your email in the chat as well? Yeah, I'll do it right now. Well, thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Take care. Yes, take care. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.